All right, good evening, everyone. It is right 6 p.m. So welcome everybody to our keynote speech um, presented by our Women in Industrial Science, Design, Engineering and Manufacturing at Elements Community College and sponsored by a National Science Foundation grant. I am super excited to see you all here tonight and I am looking forward to spending the next hour with you all. Before we get started, please stay muted during the session if you do have any questions and we are starting our discussion. Of course, feel free to unmute yourself, ask your question. I will also be your moderator today. So if you feel more comfortable asking that question in the chat, please feel free to do so and we will make sure your questions get answered. If you are not familiar with our wisdom group, so our women in industrial science, design, engineering and manufacturing, I just want to share a couple of words with you. So this is a group at ACC for all the women working in male dominated areas like manufacturing or the trades. So think of welding, HVAC, um, mechatronics, automotive, a little bit of the agricultural classes as well, programs as well. So every area that really we as women um, are underrepresented. And this wisdom group offers mentorship opportunities. We offer networking events for you. And we are in the process of starting to offer scholarships. So if you ever need anything, please feel free to reach out to us. We also have monthly lunch and learns. Um, so once a month, we have a 12 to 1 p.m. session with a female industry leader. You can ask all your questions. You can network, you can connect, you can learn something new. And then, of course, we have an annual summer camp for high school girls. If you are interested in learning more, please go to elementscc.edu slash wisdom. So it's really easy. Also, I have one announcement. Tomorrow, we actually have our next Lunch and Learn with Heather Daw Rose. And she will talk about her path about becoming a woman in this area, um, being one of the only women in the STEM field working with men about female leadership and uh, about possible challenges. So please join us tomorrow. Once again, go to elementcc.edu slash wisdom to register for this event. And with this, I'm super happy to turn it over to my colleague, Jerry Free. She is the department head of animal care and she will introduce our keynote speaker today. Jerry, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Everyone hear me? Great. Um, well, first of all, hello, and it's so great to see everyone here. Um, really excited to introduce someone who really we actually I actually grew up with. Um, me and her go way back to childhood when we were in Girl Scouts together, um, and even went to the same high school. Um, so I have known the Miss Dr. Ziddy for a very long time, very long time. <laughs> um, so it's really good that I'm really excited that she's coming to talk to you all and just share her experience. And I can tell you, this is one young lady who is super passionate about what she does. And when you listen to someone who's so passionate, it gets you excited and you're like, oh my gosh, I want to be where she is at doing something in my field. So I'm just so excited to um, introduce Dr. Zidi Numala. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to you, Zidi. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. Jerry, I appreciate the introduction. It's really cool getting to see people as children and then see them grow up. Cause I feel the same way about you, Jerry. You getting to do stuff that you really love. So uh, it's just incredible. And thank you to Bettina just for the invitation. Um, a lot of what I'll bring today over the next 30 minutes or so we could spend an entire year digging into to the content. And so if it feels like I'm putting a lot out in a short amount of time, it's because I am. And what I'm hoping for is that within those 30 minutes, if there is something that piques your interest that you want to dive into a little bit more, we'll have about 15 minutes at the end to dig into that a little bit deeper, okay? Um, so if it's okay, I wanna go ahead and get started. I have a PowerPoint here uh, i'm still a little bit old school in that way um so i'm gonna do a screen share real quick and can you all see my first slide 
Perfect. All right. Well, first, uh, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name, my full name is Zitobile Mumalo. The X is a click. And they say that uh, if you ride horses, it's that sound that you use to tell the horse, like, giddy up, you know? And so Mumalo is my last name. Uh, but for most people, I'm a teacher as well. Uh, so most of my students say Dr. Numalo, uh, but the X is, in fact, a click. All right. Um, I'm originally from Swaziland, which is a country on the border of South Africa. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, both of my parents were the medical field. My mom was born and raised in South Africa. My father was born and raised in Swaziland. And so when you talk about male dominated industries, um, you know, my grandfather was the minister of health in Swaziland. And so he was the original Dr. Numalo, but he was an MD, uh, not a PhD. And so technical language, technical industries, um, it's that's something that I've grown up around in a number of different ways. And so we came to Greensboro, North Carolina in the mid 1980s for education. So from the age of four on up, I was raised and educated in Greensboro uh, with the exception of like five and a half years in Atlanta. So, you know, I've had the opportunity to see quite a lot over the course of my career. Um, so what I wanted to do was start out by sharing a little bit of the obstacle course that's been my adult career. Uh, as I go through a bit of my own story, I want you to think about yours. I always introduce this way because, you know, if we had the time to open up and give everybody a chance to share your story, I'm certain yours would be perhaps a little bit topsy-turvy as well. So, you know, like Jerry said, uh, we graduated from Dudley High School, the best high school in Greensboro. Uh, and after that, I started my undergraduate journey in Atlanta, Georgia at Spelman College, um, I ended up finishing undergrad in business at Guilford College. And because I transferred, I ended up actually having three minors. So the minors were money and finance, human resources management, and African American studies. And so even from the academic realm, I've always kind of dabbled in a lot of different areas. Um, I worked in the office of the president at Bennett College for about three and a half years. And so um, in that position, I did a lot uh, in terms of relationship management, stakeholders, board members, students, faculty, lots of different people. Um, I ended up getting my master's degree from UNCG in communication studies, and I immediately started teaching at Guilford Technical Community College. So I love, love, love the community college environment. Um, it's where I, you know, cut my teeth speak as an educator, and I had everything in my classroom from, you know, 17-year-olds taking classes to get college credit to 60-year-olds who had retired and wanted to brush up on their public speaking and communication skills. So the community college environment is really, really um, a, a wonderful one in which to gain like a lot of different perspectives from a lot of different people. Um, I ended up getting my PhD in leadership studies from North Carolina a and State University. <laughs> and then I started my company, which is called Deftable. Um, it's a leadership development business. And right now in the leadership development world, it's been really, really exciting because I've been doing quite a lot of coaching for women who are in positions of top leadership in a number of different agencies and organizations. And so um, it's been uh, phenomenal getting a chance to listen to the challenges that they had even before COVID hit, but then with the world changing the way that it is, really being able to engage with people as they're going through it. So I'm excited to share a little bit about that. Um, worked in the nonprofit sector with the YMCA, I got recruited to Northwestern Mutual to do wealth management for a while, and I became the first woman in the Greensboro office to hit their Pace Setter 40 Award, which is a sales and productivity milestone. Um, if I was to, you know, identify one of the environments that kind of was the most uh, divergent, I guess, where it was predominantly men, it would be Northwestern Mutual for sure. At the time that I started, I was the only woman financial representative. The other women who worked for the business were all assistants to the men who were the financial representatives or the wealth managers. So I learned quite a lot during that experience about how to really thrive in an environment like that. Um, and then most recently, I got certified in executive leadership coaching through the Center for Creative Leadership. Um, so I say all that to say that when all of these, you know, little cobblestone hops in the career, um, the reason I named my business Deftable is because I really like the word deft. 
a lot of people uh, have not heard of it. It's like an underutilized word, which I'm really, really into. And what it means to be deft is to be skillful, to be quick and clever, to be skilled. And so uh, a football player can be described as deft. A writer can be described as deft. Uh, individual in the fields that Bettina mentioned that are part of wisdom could be and should be described as deft. And so everything uh, that I do in my professional life is about human behavior, how we communicate, how we can lead more authentically. Um, this idea of being authentic in leadership, authentic even as you lead yourself, I mean, I, I'm obsessed with it. And it's, you know, a shame that um, many of us are put in a position to not have to be authentic, but that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Um, so, you know, here's the truth. Uh, most of us have actually been raised to wear a mask. You know, we're in these COVID times and a lot of people are really upset about this uh, physical mask, but I wanted to start out by showing a really quick clip. It's only, uh, it's less than four minutes long. Um, it's a trailer for a documentary called The Mask We Live In, I believe. Um, but you'll get the idea. Uh, I wanted to end this video and it will sort of serve as a basis for the rest of what uh, we'll be talking about today. So give me a second. Stop crying. Stop, Stop with on. the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotion. Don't be a pussy. Hold on. All right, let me try this again. Okay, can you all see this YouTube screen? Awesome, and I'll start it over. Here we go. Stop crying. Stop with the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotions. Don't be a pussy. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. Always keep your mouth shut. Nobody likes a tattletale. Bros come before the hoes. Don't let your woman run your you life. You bitch. What a fat lady. Do something. Be a man. Be a man. Grow some balls. The three most destructive words that every man receives when he's a boy is when he's told to be a man. We've constructed an idea of masculinity in the United States that doesn't give young boys a way to feel secure in their masculinity. So we make them go prove it all the time. Within their peer group culture, each of them is posturing based on how the other boys are posturing. And what they end up missing is what they each really want, which is just that closeness. In good times, guys are like really close to each other. But when things get a little bit worse, you're on your own. From middle school, I had four really close friends. Once I kind of went into high school, I struggle <laughs> finding people I can talk to because I feel like I'm not supposed to get help. Our kids get up every morning. They have to prepare their mask for how they're going to walk to school. A lot of our seniors don't know how to take the mask off. What is it you don't let people see? Almost 90% of you have pain and anger on the back of that paper. If you never cry, then you have all these feelings stuffed up inside of you, and then you can't get them out. They really buy into the, a culture that doesn't value what we've feminized. If we're in a culture that doesn't value caring, doesn't value relationships, doesn't value empathy, you are going to have boys and girls, men and women, go crazy. I had anger issues in high school. I felt like an outcast. I've been suspended at least once every year I was here. We would just look for trouble and just like try to fight. Boys are more likely to act out. They're more likely to become aggressive. Most people miss that as depression or see it as a conduct disorder or just a bad kid. I felt like just giving up on life. You know, I see, I had suicide thoughts in my head in sixth grade. I felt alone for, for a long time. And uh, I actually thought about killing myself. Whether it's homicidal violence or suicidal violence, People resort to such desperate behavior only when they are feeling shame and humiliated or feel they would be if they didn't prove that they were real men. If you're told from day one, don't let nobody disrespect you, and this is the way you handle it as a man, respect is linked to violence. If I can man up, why well, step down from that, you feel me? It's like instinct. Oh, some fucking balls! 
act like a man. Be a man. Be a man. For my kids, I'm going to end the cyber masculine narrative here. Okay. Uh, are you all, uh, hold on just a second. Sorry, y'all. I always have um, a little bit of trouble with the Zoom thing. Here we go. All right, can you see the PowerPoint again? All right, excellent. Okay, so the reason I wanted to uh, start with that video is because in, in order for us to really understand how to effectively thrive environment that is uh, predominantly uh, comprised of men, we have to understand like the mindset and the heart set that we're walking into. Um, if you have time to watch the documentary in its fullness, I really, really encourage you to do so. Um, the world is changing rapidly uh, right before our eyes. And, you know, for, for women who aspire to go into industries that are predominantly male dominated, my assessment from everything that, that I've experienced academically and professionally is that those of us who are able to really understand the science of emotion and emotional intelligence, we're the ones who are really gonna be able to thrive. Um, many of us may have heard of the term IQ, uh, which is the intelligence quotient, right? It's like a number used to uh, assign a value to our level of intelligence. Some people argue that IQ is outdated right now, uh, we won't talk about that, but if you understand a bit about IQ, IQ then we understand that EQ, uh, which, you know, the other uh, term is em emotional quotient. So you've got your intelligence quotient, your emotional quotient. How intelligent we can be with our emotions um, is going to drastically impact the effectiveness that we have in these environments. And so according to Dr. Daniel Goleman, who is the guy who uh, developed alongside other researchers this concept, if we're healthy, whether we're, uh, we identify as men, women, or otherwise, if we develop in a healthy way in our emotional intelligence, there are certain skills that we're supposed to have by a particular time in our childhood development. And I go through those really quickly, beginning with elementary school years, but I really want you to give honest consideration to yourself, first of all, like try to remember your younger self to see if you were in fact developing these skills in this way at the time. And if you have children in your life right now, think about them and whether they're developing these skills uh, during this time as well. And so we'll uh, get into it a little bit here. All right, so during our entry school years, so we're talking like pre-kindergarten to second grade or so, if we are developed well in our emotional intelligence, we're supposed to be able to not only recognize how it is that we feel emotionally, but we're supposed to be able to accurately label those emotions and see how they influence our actions. So in other words, a child at that age is supposed to be able to know the difference between I'm sad, I'm mad, I'm frustrated, and be able to articulate that because that's what helps the adults in the child's life know how to appropriately respond. Well, you all know, I mean, we haven't even gotten into the messages that women receive in our childhood, but you can see from that trailer that if you're surrounded by men who from a very young age, many of whom have been given these messages to basically teach the exact opposite of this, not only are you not supposed to feel the thing, but if you feel it, God forbid you express it, like suck it up, you know, um, young boys don't cry. This is a dangerous message that is even more dangerous because of how pervasive it is, you know? So think about that from, from the young age, uh, the messages that are sent. So then, you know, by the time you get to about third to fifth grade, we're also supposed to be able to have this ability to empathize with other people, um, identifying nonverbal clues from other people to sense how they feel. So this is the child who, if your friend or your classmate comes in, and their energy feels different, or they look different. We're supposed to have this ability to say, hey, you know, you don't seem like yourself. Is something going on, you know? Uh, we, we know, you know, what it's like to be around children who uh, maybe kind of 
uh, oblivious to, to what's going on emotionally around them. Um, and unfortunately, many of us have found ourselves around adults as well, who lack the ability to uh, pick up on the nonverbal cues that how another person is doing. I'm telling you that my ability to empathize and, and pick up on other people's feelings has been one of the most powerful tools that I've used to build relationships with both men and women. Um, in all of the environments that I've been in, when you get that moment where you're able to uh, talk with someone one-on-one, -on -one, when they feel comfortable enough with you to let that guard down and let that mask down, and they know that you have the maturity to be able to hold whatever it is that they share with you um, in confidence, unless it's dangerous. <laughs> Uh, it, that's a really, really powerful way to build relationships with people, um, and that has a direct impact on what it is that you're able to do in the workplace as well. So if we're healthy by the time we get to fifth grade, this is where we're supposed to be in terms of our emotional development. So then in middle school, critical, critical time. From what I understand, there are uh, some young people on right now, and I really, really want you to listen closely if you happen to be within that age demographic. Middle school is really, really tough. Um, middle school is when we start, you know, many of us start noticing things happening to our bodies, our voices, hormones, all the things. If we are developing well <laughs> in a healthy way, we're supposed to be able to analyze what it is that causes stress in our lives. Because for many of us, um, you know, all things considered, middle school is often the time when the stress begins get cranked up. So we need to be able to analyze what it is that causes that stress in our life. But then we're also supposed to be able to know how to turn that stress into motivation so that we can improve our performance. Well, what do we do instead? Middle school is when a lot of young people begin to smoke it away or video game it away or some sex it away. You find unhealthy ways to deal with stress instead of figuring out how to shift that stress into motivation. And so there are a gazillion tools that can help us figure out to do how, how to do that um, if that's an area that you want to develop. But again, by the time you get to those high school years, the other piece of the puzzle is high school, we should have the ability to listen. Listening, you know, many people may have heard it described as the lost art. Listening, again, powerful, powerful tool. If you pay attention to what people are saying to you and you have the ability to kind of suspend your own thoughts temporarily to really tune in to what it is that's motivating they really, really care about, what it is that they're not saying, understanding how to ask the right questions to get the right piece of information, it, it can take you so, so very far. Um, in, in addition to having the ability to listen, if we're able to cultivate this uh, ability to resolve conflict instead of escalating it, that is the kind of foundation that we want to be able to have in terms of emotional intelligence. And all of this is supposed to be by the time we graduate high school. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I wasn't there. You know, a, a lot of my emotional intelligence has been cultivated and continues to be cultivated as an adult. Um, but again, understanding the emotion, especially, especially within a highly technical environment, is incredibly, incredibly important. One of my former lives, um, I taught uh, public speaking and speech communication at North Carolina A and T, agriculture and tech. It's agricultural and technical state university. So many of my students were engineers. They were um, uh, physicists, chemists, biologists. And so in terms of intelligence and mastery over subject matter, they're absolutely brilliant. But then when it came to interpersonal relationships and being able to relate with other people and speak comfortably in front of a group, a lot of times that was something that was a challenge. And so cultivating both that left brain, logical, analytical way of thinking, also the right brain, relational, creative, if you're able to really, really acknowledge those sides of yourself and strengthen those, um, it'll put you in an incredible position, especially for the future of the workplace. Because people are figuring out like, yo, the old way of doing things like this macho machismo, you know, let me try to control people kind of way of leading, people aren't into that anymore. And now we're in this technology 
where it is almost um, dangerous to be that way because now people can record you and then you're a liability for the business. Um, so for a lot of reasons, it's really important to understand the role of emotional intelligence in our relationships um, in the workplace. Um, so I, I like to go over these kind of common challenges I know I only have a few minutes left here before we open up the floor um, for questions, but I, I really want everybody to, to understand that even though we may work in uh, varying industries, there are a lot of human behavior related challenges that are similar. And so I want to give just a few examples. Um, so, you know, you, you may have people who are new in management. You may find yourself in one part of your career leading a project, you know, but then all of a sudden you get promoted and you're leading people, how do you effectively make that transition? That's a challenge that regardless of how you identify gender wise, that's something that we wanna know how to do, right? Another challenge across industries, having an honest culture. How do you create and be a part of a workplace culture where people aren't gossiping by the water cooler about what's going on in the business, but they're comfortable enough to speak very honestly and very openly and respectfully in a group environment about the elephant in the room. Businesses suffer, suffer greatly when the honest person is the one who's ostracized and the future of industry, the future of entrepreneurship, the future of business is really, really shining a light on those people who are willing to be honest in the workplace. And again, honesty and having the ability to be really logical and uh, realistic in your approach, that can take you far. I'm Ruth Bader Ginsburg. If you haven't gotten a chance to watch RBG, my goodness. First of all, I like cried the whole way through. I just was intensely inspired. But one of the things that stood out to me about her was this idea of sharing information um, related to the law without the emotion in it. I don't know if you can tell yet or not, but it's really difficult for me to like hold back my emotion because I feel all the things all the time. But there's something to be said for the ability to share truthfully in a, a, a collective environment in an honest way, because for people who really care about getting the job done, they'll respect it. They might not like it, but they'll respect it. Another challenge, growing uh, an exemplary team, bringing out the best in the members of your team. You might be having group assignments in school right now. That is a skill to have, like how do you bring together all these people who are really different and identify what their strengths are and figure out how to speak to those strengths so that you're bringing out the best in other people. That art. And when we talk about like the older, more masculine models of leadership, we've negated that part in many ways. And I'm telling you like as a, a you know, technically, I, you know, I'm a leadership practitioner or whatever. In the field of leadership from the local to the global size, everybody is talking about this idea of, you know, we no longer are saying things like, you know, leave your door. You know, people are whole people. We're not talking about widgets here. We're talking about people with hearts and families and challenges and all kinds of things. And so in order to uh, bring out the best in people, we have to be uh, highly emotionally intelligent. And that's something that um, as women, we really have an opportunity to, to boss it. Um, another challenge, navigating difficult personalities. I touched on this just a little bit already, but um, again, ineffective communication patterns in the workplace. You know, now you've got kids on TikTok who will secretly record and put it on the world wide web for all to see. So again, like our behaviors and managing ourselves and our personalities and understanding how to communicate well with other people, it can be something that saves not only us and our careers, but other people's as well. So cultivate that ability. All right, so now, you know, I've done my academic -y thing. Um, I'm not a mom, I am an auntie though. And so I wanted to leave everybody with five kind of last tidbits of advice here. Um, and then we'll open up for a Q&A. Hopefully um, you've been able to glean something of value in all of this and we'll be able to dig deeper. But the first one is, you know, as a woman, as a professional, uh, you know, the, the me this message, the resounding message of like, always having to wait for permission from someone else or even in the um, 
the Christian faith. I say that, you know, because we live in the Bible belt, this idea of like waiting to be chosen. There's something that's ingrained in many of us as women that we cannot take ownership of our own options. We're always kind of yielding to the options of other people. So I want to encourage you, no matter where you are in life, start paying attention to what you like and what you don't. From the tiniest thing to the largest thing. When you are eating a meal, do you eat what you really like? Or do you eat what you don't like to try to be polite? Music. When you listen to music, are you like faking and pretending like you like the song and really you're like, oh, it's not really my jam. Like, know what you like. Know what you like and like it unapologetically. And if you don't, don't like it. You know, this people pleasing thing. I am like your quintessential people pleaser. Like, I'm the church girl. I, I grew up as a dancer. So hypercritical environments, just always, you know, contortions to suit someone else's blah, blah, blah. Don't do, you know, there, there is certainly something to be said for discipline and order and ensemble. So I'm not saying like go rogue and forget everybody else. I'm just saying know who you are. Don't get lost in the sauce. Um, make it a practice daily to really ask yourself, do I like this? How does this make me feel? You know, and then once you've made that decision, take ownership of your choices. You know, we playing game, my goodness, I have to like keep myself out of the comment section on uh, social media now um, because, you know, we've got this culture of blaming other people. Um, and yes, there are other people who have made really jacked up decisions that have put many of us in really challenging positions. I say this as an immigrant from Southern which was colonized. I say that as a, 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 an African chick who grew up getting made fun of by the black kids and the white kids and everybody in between. I say that as, you know, a, a black woman with locks, my hair has been, you know, an issue. So I'm, I'm saying that if, if there was room to blame, I have every opportunity to blame other people for my circumstances. Does no good at all. When we find ourselves in circumstances in the workplace and outside, taking ownership of our choices is what will help us get unstuck. As long as we make someone else in our lives a supervillain, um, we're never able to, to move forward. And so uh, speaking of moving forward, third piece of advice is know how to make decisions. You know, I, you know, I have been notoriously indecisive in the past, you know, in the restaurant, everywhere. When I decided and I learned how to take a moment to, to pause, pray, breathe, eat a snack, listen to music, whatever you need to do in order to clear your mind and then make a decision and then go, it's always ushered me into the next great chapter of my life, the next great adventure. And so again, um, no matter where you find yourselves in whatever industry, uh, if you're feeling stuck, find whatever process works for you in order to get to a place of making a decision and then move. Fourth thing, is to always analyze yourself before analyzing anybody else, which kind of goes hand in hand with the, uh, what I said about owning your choices. But again, self-analysis, mastering yourself. Before um, I decided what my uh, research was gonna be on when I was getting the PhD, I obsessed over this concept of self-leadership, you know, because as a, as a kid, I, I, you know, as a daughter of, uh, Southern African immigrants, I, I also am very like responsible, you know what I'm saying? So I'm taking instructions from this parent, this parent, I'm very like dutiful and orderly in many ways. Um, and so learning how to really master myself and understand how my own brain works, how my ideas work, when my brain is most functional, that stuff really matters. You no, know? it's like, you may have a nine to five, but you better figure out when your peak hours are and put your important tasks in those spaces. Um, understand when you're dehydrated and need to drink water because that'll make your brain foggy. I mean, really, really become an expert in all things you so that you won't find yourself um, in a position of being victimized by anybody else. Master yourself and analyze yourself before you analyze other people. And then finally, this is probably the most important thing that I'm gonna to share today. And then I'm gonna pass it to you, Bettina, so we can talk. 
nurture your valuable non-sexual relationships. What I mean by this is one of the masks that, that we're taught to put on as women and one of the patterns that we're taught to repeat, it's like every man that comes in our life or every person who comes in our life that we may have an attraction to, we automatically think it's supposed to get sexual or romantic. That is farthest from the truth. I've seen so many times when individuals have felt a sort of a chemistry with a person, which chemistry is real. You want chemistry in the workplace. You want chemistry in business. You want chemistry when you're innovating and coming up with ideas. But if we make the mistake of always thinking that chemistry is synonymous with sex or romance, we can ruin our careers. You know what I'm saying? People make one unsavory decision and it follows you the rest of your life. Thank you, Chris, for picking up on my, my woman <laughs> that I laid out here. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, no under that's again, it's a part of the self mastery. You're going to have lots of conversations with lots of different men. And when you work closely with men, they'll begin to confide in you. Um, workplace affairs are a real thing. Keep, keep your, your path tidy. I watched a documentary on um, Princess Diana, and, and she said, you know, as she grew up, he, she intentionally kept herself away from scandal. And the word she used, she was like, I, I just had this feeling that I needed to keep my personal affairs tidy in preparation for something really important that I was called to do. So keep your personal affairs tidy, okay? Because uh, if you are called to be in spaces where you are an outlier, that's really important work. And you want to be a person in a position of such an important calling um, with a, as pristine uh, a center as possible. Um, so I'll leave you with that. The end, um, I'll stop the screen share and uh, I'd love, love, love to hear from you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Zidia. If we were in person, we would all just give you a round of applause right now. Um, and, and I do see a couple of clapping hands on the screen. So awesome. Thank you so much. What an inspiring speech. I, I love listening to you. You just have so many awesome ideas. So thank you so, so much for sharing them. And I... So I'm an immigrant by myself and I'm from Germany and I know that there are so many things um, that are different here. So I, I totally feel you, even though I come from a different con uh, com continent. <laughs> but for me, I always have that language barrier and the, the later it gets, the, the worse it gets too. So, <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, the floor is open for questions, but I do have a first question. Clap, clap. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, but I do have a first question for you just to get that started. Do you think there are any specific barriers to female leadership? I do. I think one of the most specific is just our culture. We're not taught to honor and respect um, ways that are different from what other people said they're supposed to be. Because, you know, I'm tempted to say we're not to respect like the way that women move, but it's not just women. I mean, if we're really honest, okay, if everybody was really truly honest and was like, you know what, no more putting up any fronts. Let's talk about the emotions I feel on the inside. Let's talk about um, the fears that I have about not succeeding. Let's talk about the nervousness that I have speaking in front of people. That is not specific to any particular anything, really. And so I think one of the biggest barriers is kind of human tendency that we have to sort and separate. Um, there's a book called Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, um, Cast, C-A-S-T-E. And, uh, you know, in uh, East India, there's the caste system where you've got, you know, the top of the food chain, so to speak. I can't remember the official terminology for the people who are, you know, considered the top, but then like the untouchables at the bottom. Um, in Southern Africa, to this day, the people with the darkest complexion are considered black and they're the bottom of the social economic totem pole. Then you've got lighter skinned people who are colored and then the white people are the ones who have the most, you know, economically there as well, many parallels to the United States. And so again, I would say that the, the greatest barrier is our own human tendency to want to judge books by their cover instead of really discovering 
what people's genuine strengths and genuine curiosities are, and then putting the right people in the right positions. Because if we put the right people, like the smartest people, the most relational people, if we put the right people in the right position, I guarantee you a bunch of these businesses from the top down would look very different, very different. We emphasize the external way too much. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Um, so we do have a question. What advice would you have for a female trying to move up in a male dominant field and trying to show their skill versus their gender? How would you show that you offer more than just gender and the difference in views? Thank you, Presley. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the first thing I would say is it, it kind of makes me upset that we have to feel like we don't, we shouldn't show our gender. Like I am a woman who um, I'm, you know, I identify as a cisgender heterosexual woman. I really like pretty dresses and stuff. You know, I don't want to go into a workplace and feel like I have to like now not enjoy that because I don't want people to feel uncomfortable. So I just wanted to say that. Um, in terms of advice, Presley, find an ally. Find somebody within the organization who really sees you. And it doesn't matter, again, it doesn't matter who they look like, what they look like, but if you can find somebody, especially someone in a position of influence who would be willing to sit down with you, who may be willing to share their story with you and the, the bumps and bruises that they've gotten along the way with you, and then work as uh, like an advocate for you, has been one of the most effective ways for me to to move through um, because when you find somebody in a position of influence who's able to kind of like do a double take and see that twinkle in your eye you know they will fight for you and so again um social capital you know if you're a, a particularly relational person and you're great with authentic relationships work them because, right, I mean, this is the season of social capital. People, you know, stock options are plummeting. People are getting furloughed and jobs. So those of us who are really going to make it and succeed on the other side are those of us who understand the value of genuine relationships. So work the relationships genuinely. Don't fake it. Be real. And, and click with real people, too. That's a great advice. Um I have another question for you. In terms of defining and honing in on a career path, are there survey instruments that you can recommend that a student can use to help identify passions and interests? Oh, boy, do I. <laughs> so in another one of my former lives, I was uh, teaching in the School of Health and Human Sciences over at UNC Greensboro. One of my colleagues over there, his name is Bill Johnson. He developed a semester long course called design a life you love. He's got goo gobs of assessments where you can identify your values, where you can go through a list of um, adjectives to describe how you want your workplace to feel. Um, there's one exercise where he gives a list of 50 questions and all you have to do is answer yes or no and it's to assess how happy you are in your life. I mean, it's just a series of tools and exercises that are really presented to help you get honest with yourself. And it takes multiple iterations. Um, in addition to teaching the semester long life design class at UNCG, Bill also does a workshop that's open to the public. And now he's gone virtual this year. And he and I have talked about doing some work together. As a matter of fact, on the 21st of this month, um, we're going to do like a virtual panel discussion together. Um, so I'll share that information with Bettina in case anybody is interested in that. Um, but yeah, he's an incredible resource. Also through, you you know, my own business with the coaching that I do with individuals and groups, always assessing. Sometimes it's like an actual formal assessment that you fill out. Other times it's just questions that come up uh, that will cause you to consider things that you have never considered before. In our busy body lifestyles, sometimes we haven't, we don't know what our purpose is just because nobody's ever like asked us the right questions, you know? So um, I, lo I love that, I love that question. Uh, and yeah, I I'm happy to offer more on that if you need it. Yes, absolutely. So if you would share that information with me, I will definitely send it out to the group. Thank you. All right, you have a question too. Hey, uh, did you say Larissa? Sorry, just cut out there for a sec. Bettina? Yes, I can see you. Perfect. 
Um, so I loved the five points of advice uh, that is so helpful. In regards to your last point, uh, nurture your valuable non-sexual relationships. One of the things that our company has implemented is that we don't let uh, two people alone in the office where there's not the safety net of other team members around. What are some practical boundaries that, that we can put in place uh, even for our own lives, whether it's you know mandated by the company or not, to ensure that we are above, above reproach and that you know we're living a life of integrity. Yeah, yeah, great question. For me, you know, when you think about like businesses, I we set the standard from the time that we like recruit people in. So the first thing I would say is with onboarding, with interviews, with even description make it really clear what the organization's values are and make it a point to draw that out of the candidate or the potential candidate from the very beginning. Um, that way you, you know, and of course, I mean, everybody, if people aren't necessarily in an interview going to say, hey, I might be inappropriate in the workplace, you know what I mean? But you do pick up on people's integrity, you know what I'm saying? You pick up on people's um, values and just vet that. Uh, another thing that I would say is to do things to encourage a culture of honesty. Um, and for a lot of workplaces, it's really uncomfortable at first because again, you know, networking events and schmoozing with the boss, all that stuff, it teaches us to kind of like posture. If we in meetings, in um, coaching sessions, ever is appropriate for your environment, if you encourage an environment of truth telling, what that means is that if there is something that is inappropriate that's happening, a person will be more likely to, to say it and speak on it um, than not. Uh, so, you know, those are, those are kind of the first things that come to mind. I'd really love to give that question more thought, Larissa, so that I can uh, send you, I don't know, something, I guess, a little more organized. But uh, yeah, those are the first two things that came to mind. Thank you. The question is, how would you push a young female, 23 years old, to prove herself to others, males, when it is difficult to show the passion she may have? Uh, I have a question for the question. Presley, do you mind saying a little bit more about what makes it difficult to show the passion? Can you hear me? I feel like it's easier to talk than it is to type it out. <laughs> Yes, it's all good. Um, so it's very difficult for me in the position that I'm in. Um, I am considered a second in the store that I'm in currently. I'm in automotive. So it's difficult for me to show the passion that I have. I've been in the industry for seven years, so since I was 16. To prove myself, I guess wouldn't be the correct word, but to prove myself to the males or the hires in the company that own the business that I'm trying to prove to them that I'm ready to do this and I'm pushing myself as hard as possible doing things outside of business hours and just really trying to push myself to be the best that I can to get there. But I don't think it's being portrayed that way or coming through. Yeah. And what, uh, what are you trying to do? Is it tell a bit more about the work that you're wanting to do within the business? There's a method to the questions, I promise. Okay, so I am looking to be a store manager. We are a smaller company. We're kind of local. So we have nine locations. It's Chapel Hill Tire. Um, I have been, a, my dream has been to have my own shop by myself where I have my own team that I'm pushing them and encouraging them to be the best that they can. Since that is not necessarily in the reach, I'm going for a store management position where I still have my own team and I'm able to push them and encourage them and lead by example but it's very difficult trying to get out of the position that I'm in. And I'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything, but I feel like it's difficult because the boss that I'm under doesn't want me to leave because I do so much for him that he doesn't want me to leave because then he's gonna have to take it all back over. Does that make sense? It does, absolutely, yeah. Which, it, that's so unfortunate. That's happened to me as well, where I didn't find out until years after the fact that different positions that I was applying for within the organization, 
the person above me was blocking them because of that exact same reason. I was so efficient in my role supporting them that they didn't want to see me progress. So unfortunately, you do have some jerk type activities happening. Um, what I would say is right now, you know, businesses are struggling to figure out how to cope with the pandemic. Businesses that are able to innovate something new to help operations either be safer or more efficient or increase clientele during a time where many other businesses are decreasing. If Presley can become that person to offer something to help improve operations in some sort of a way, that's how we add value. So I would say don't, I, I wouldn't uh, trying to prove yourself, um, but that's something that puts us in a position of always just like having to yield to other people. Perhaps the timing of you opening up your own shop is not right now, right this second, but always keep that in mind because everything you make now is audition time. You know what I'm saying? So with the circumstances that you're in right now, I would just encourage you to be really, really observant, pay attention to what needs exist for other people aside from, from the person that you're currently working under. and brand yourself as a solution oriented type of person. And if they don't have the kind of environment that would recognize that kind of value in you, then I would say the next move is, you know, think, pray, plan, and come up with an exit strategy because there are lots of automotive shops that would love Presley there. You know what I'm saying? Don't let yourself get stuck. Come up with an exit plan if you're not getting what it is that you need and keep it moving. Okay. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, Josh said, don't be afraid to jump ship. Absolutely. Do we have any other questions? Yep, Chris says, keep moving forward. So Dr. Zitti, what do you think about mentors? Do you think that helps on your way to leadership? And what, what is the value of having a mentor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first, yes, absolutely, mentors can be helpful. Um, in the spirit of self-mastery, really, really know what you are needing from that mentor and think about what it is that you can offer to the mentor. If you're in a healthy mentoring relationship, yes, you get something from them in terms of like knowledge, in terms of their influence and help getting you different places, but a good mentor also gets a great deal of satisfaction from seeing you thrive. So if you have a mentor that has this kind of attitude where they're like always needing to kind of put you in your place, a kind of passive aggressive remarks to help you feel a bit smaller, run for the hills. Not really, but I'm just saying like know who you're dealing with because sometimes mentors who are humans just like us, their insecurities will come up in their own mentorship practices. So really pay attention to whether the mentor makes you feel bigger and more capable and more powerful and more confident, or if after you leave them, they leave you feeling deflated and like you have to jump through even more hoops and that you don't have what it takes. People play mind games out here. And so, you know, pay attention to yourself. I'm a huge advocate of therapy. It's helped me understand again, how like younger Ziddy has processed information and how kind of like those bad seeds have gotten planted where now adult Ziddy knows how to like advocate for herself and and ground herself and take care of herself you know what I mean um so you know and it's okay to outgrow mentors that's something I discovered about myself is like I felt this obligation like if someone was mentoring me at one place in my life even though I felt like okay we're done here I felt like I still had to keep you know look you don't, oh, I mean, I'm not saying dishonorable, don't be rude, always be kind, but know when it's time to move on. Know when it's time to move on from the job, from the mentor, from the friend, from the relationship. If you really desire to see yourself as a powerful career woman, pay attention to people. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. It's not just toxic relationship in your personal life with a partner. It can be at work too. And basically everywhere in your life. So that's a very good, um, very good advice. Okay, um, I have one last question for you. And that is, are there any women that inspire you? Oh, so many. <laughs> so many. <laughs> so many. Like I, first of all, not just women, but people 
who have um, stories where they, you know, overcame challenges. I'm like obsessed with the hero's journey, the heroine's journey. I love um, everything from Disney movies, Moana, okay? I love Moana. It just, it's a movie that brings me back to like a childlike place and it inspires me. But then also documentaries about women, you know, I mentioned RBG, super inspiring. I so regret not having um, gotten more into her and her work prior to her passing, but it's still really, really enormously valuable now. Um, I read Michelle Obama's book, Becoming. Oh my goodness. It just, how does one prepare for a responsibility that huge? You know, it just, she, and, and the way that she just shares her story, it, it just left me feeling more capable, you know? Um, I mentioned, you know, Princess Diana, another recent uh, documentary that I watched. I'm really into documentaries, autobiographies. Um, I have a podcast, so anytime I encounter a woman who scares or intimidates me, I decide I want to befriend her. And so I'll invite scary people <laughs> on my show because when I feel intimidated, it's really because I recognize something that I admire in that other person. And so how can I like change that story so that I'm learning from them, um, but also, not being too naive where, you know, sometimes that's backfired on me where I've been so starstruck and googly eyed that I end up getting taken advantage of and I break my own rule of mastering myself, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah. There are a lot, there's so many incredible women out there to study. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, for everyone else, if you go back to our event website today to edgefactor.com slash AATC minus AATC minus takeover, sorry, you can find a lot of really cool videos of very strong women finding their path, um, learn more about what they do. And uh, Larissa is just sharing the link. Thank you. And we also have a couple of very cool cinematic more cinematic um, documentary. So really following this woman, finding more, finding out more about her path and just learning more about that. All right, Dr. Zidi, thank you so, so much. That was awesome. Um, once again, I'm very happy that you spoke to us today. Um, everyone else, thank you so much for joining us. The recording of this session will be online on the event website after this, um, well, probably tomorrow, tomorrow on Friday. So if you want to rewatch that, if you want to share it with somebody else, please always feel free to do that. And um, otherwise, thank you so much tonight for joining us. And I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bettina. Thank you, Jerry. Thank, thank you, thank Dr. Zidi. Thank you, Dr. Zitti.